Okay, good. So now I think we are live on YouTube and uh, Ehud, whenever you're ready, let's get started. Uh, like I had mentioned uh, before, I think we're going to start with the review of what uh, what Ehud did last time and we can have questions on that before moving on. So whenever you're ready, go ahead Ehud. Yeah, um, okay. So, so let me get back a little bit to what we uh, discussed last time. So maybe I'll put my outline again. Um, I, I talked about mainly focusing on uh, the MBL transition and the role played by rare regions of, especially thermal regions inside the MBL phase uh, to trigger uh, the instability towards a many, uh, to trigger the instability to, to the thermal phase. And I, I mentioned that we don't understand so well um, the physics inside the MBL phase. So if before you know, we thought that we can explain everything in a simple model with um, uh, a simple effective model of the MBL phase with uh, local integrals of motion, it looks like these rare regions, although you know, formally we can think of them also as some very big and overlapping integrals of motion, it's, it's maybe not the best description. And, and there are um, processes that are hard to, because of this overlap between integrals of motion inside the rare regions, there are effects, especially close to the MBL transition that we um, don't understand so well, but at least we can uh, phenomenologically give a minimal model uh, that describes the instability um, taking place at multiple scales, and it gives a uh, costerlitz daulis like um, scaling theory for, for the MBL critical point. Um, I think this is more or less where I left off, and I, I gave a few exercises uh, for you to, you know, test your understanding of, of own understanding of, of what we discussed. And maybe I can uh, open with asking you to, to you know, Ask your questions. Maybe you have some. You had some time to digest uh, since yesterday, and maybe you have some questions on on the last lecture or on the questions. Um, anyone? So while they're recalling their questions, I did have a question, which okay. is. Uh, I was wondering, so uh, essentially all of the flow that you showed here and all the arguments, I think they were more or less restricted to one dimensional systems. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, could you get insight into the instability of MBL and higher dimensions from these types of arguments? And can you write down an RG flow? You know, is it just a matter of replacing this log two with zero or something when you construct the flow equations? Right, so so I, I'm not sure if I put it in a question or I had a small remark that I didn't even uh, discuss here. Um, but unfortunately, if you take this avalanche instability uh, seriously, uh, where was it? Yeah, I think here. Yeah, if you take this avalanche instability seriously in, in two dimensions and above, then, um, and what you find is the unfortunate situation that MBL can never be stable. Um, and, and basically the reason for that is if you remember uh, the basic thing was this competition between the matrix element and how it decays away from the region and, and the level spacing uh, of this effective bat. And um, in two dimensions, for example, the uh, matrix element still decays as uh, exponent of the distance from, from this effective seed. Uh, say, if we have a seed here, if we look at the radius R around it, uh, the, the, it will still decay linearly, it's exponentially, uh, but the level spacing will decay like um, exponent of the volume of, of this bat, effective bat. So if you go, so, so this, um, decay of, of the level spacing will always beat the decay of the um, matrix element and you'll always be able to thermalize and, and the um, avalanche can persist. So according to this uh, criterion, uh, there is, or according to this argument, there is no MBL at, um, in, in higher than one dimension and therefore 
one cannot build an RG. There is no critical point. You can't find so, a, a so critical guess, fixed point. Can I not think of a critical fixed point at like uh, infinite disorder strength or something like oh, this? Oh, yeah, that... then, right. Maybe, yeah, then you could say that infinite disorder is like a critical point. Um, Yeah. So, if right. I believe but but then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, but then I, I guess it's not so interesting then, right? It's not there is no st stable uh, MBL phase. It's basically always thermal, and and the thermal phase is also uninteresting in some sense. It's always diffusive, um, in this in this sense, right? So I, I'm not sure if one can really. But, but and, and you don't really need an RG because just one seed is enough to completely delocalize, de delocalize you. So you don't need the distribution of them and some of them above the tree. So, you know, the point of the RG is that in, initially we start with seeds that are, some of them are above the critical point, some are below, but here all of them are, uh, you know, they're all below the critical point or you know, because it's it's all um, thermal. Um, in, uh, yeah, so 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 then I don't think there there is a useful RG scheme or uh, it for for more than one dimension. Um, now there is there there has been a lot of arguments that in some sense I think are are futile. Whether even in one dimension. MBL is, is present or not. And one of the reasons I think is it's futile is because a lot of these things come from just, you know, ED results, which we know are not nearly in the scaling regime of, of, of the theories we discuss here. Um, and so, so it's really just these arguments cannot be falsified or um, it, it, usually. So, so I think they're, they're sort of futile. What I find nice is that at least in one dimension, there is a sensible RG fixed point that describes a, tr a transition, which is completely kosher as far as I can see from, from any, any like, has all the right properties to be a MBL transition. And, and, and the, what, what I showed is just this phenomeno phenomenological scaling theory, but then you can actually take this phenomenological scaling theory and try to fit its predictions to more, to different kinds of more microscopic RG approaches. And, and this was done in this paper by Dumitrescu and company that I, I pointed out. And they showed really nice agreement with, with these very different, two, at least two very different RG, microscopically different RG approaches, but it seems to lead to a similar um, critical behavior. So, so I, I, I tend to believe that, you know, if, if there is a good phenomenological RG fixed point, it probably also occurs in nature, or at least um, if it doesn't, it's due to a very, very, um, strange kind of instability that would be interesting to find, but it probably is very hard to observe in reality. Um, so so that, that's my, my take on this. I, I don't know if I can say much more on, on whether, you know, to, to um, refute this argument that there is no phase transition at all, or I, I wouldn't say there is a real argument actually. Um, Okay. Um, other other questions? Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you said when you said in two D or in higher dimensions, MBL is probably unstable and won't survive. But we can still have, I guess, pre thermal regions. Is that still allowed? Uh, uh, there are what? Which thermal? Uh, pre thermal regions uh, are. Pre thermal are regions. Yeah. So so it's it's true. So as I uh, noticed. Uh, as I noted, for example, the, one can still do this kind of uh, um, Basco-Alainer Altschuler criterion. And it's not pre-thermal regions in the sense I would say that maybe um, uh, David talked about, but it's pre-thermal regions in the sense that part a creation of, perturbative creation of particle hole excitations is suppressed. 
And what you need to get to the thermal phase is, is sort of a non-perturbative instability. And, and I think there is still a lot to do to understand this kind of crossover and uh, what, is, uh, what are the manifestations of this kind of crossover in, in the real system. And, and that could be interesting. So this Basquiat-Lehner Altular argument that there is a stable localized phase still has, I think, experimental manifestations. And, and you could call it a pre-thermal MBL region, or it's, it's not really MB, it's not true MBL. But it will be seen as such over some some scale. So there's a question from Grace. Uh, could you briefly go over the second exercise about the decay of a density wave? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was the exercise? Let me remind myself, yes. Um, um, yeah. Right, so, so um, yeah, the, the idea here is, um, to find, first of all, that, yeah, so, so I, I, I want to remind you what is the uh, uh, question. The question is, now I'm not thinking about transport, I'm, I'm thinking about a decay of some operator like a density wave that is not conserved. It's not a density, it's a density, it's a finite wave vector. I want to know how it decays. Um, so, so I have different regions in my system. So I'll give a brief argument without a you know, complicated calculation. Um, you have different regions and these regions have different, um, uh, so you, and let, let me look at the, um, uh, right, so we are in the thermal phase and, and this is, um, the, the decay is set by these MBL regions of size L inside the thermal phase. Um, now, if I look at a time T, I can ask how many regions are there? Um, where uh, the density wave, let's call it the operator, um, let's call it I, as I think Emmanuel called it, where I did not decay. Decay almost at all. So these are regions uh, at time t. Um, I, I, these are regions with length um, larger. Uh, how do I, will I write it? L is larger than I will say L thermal of t. So if I, I can write, there is a, a Thermalization time is dependent on, on L as on the size of the, uh, uh, sorry, not thermal region of the uh, MBL region, it's tau naught times E to the L over some L naught localization length. Uh, maybe I'll call the localization length zeta, uh, L naught. <laughs> That's how I called it. So L is equal to uh, L naught times log of uh, tau over uh, tau naught. Um, so I, I want to ask, so these are, and, and now I replace tau with t, right? Because I want to look at regions that are larger than this uh, L, right? Let's call it L of t. And what is the distribution of these regions? Well, the, uh, what, what is the distribution of, of these uh, uh, regions is P of L is equal to um, the probability that I have such a region is P of L of T is equal to, if you remember one over xi e to the minus L over xi and the probability, uh, and I can now, replace L of T and replacing L of T, I get um, T 
uh, e to the minus L naught over Xi uh, log T over tau naught, uh, which is, yeah, I can write it as T to the power minus one over Z. If you remember, this is Z, one over Z, minus one over Z, where Z is Xi over L naught. Okay, so what I find is that my, uh, my it, the density of regions that still have not decayed by that time is, is this. This is their density. It's uh, all, the, all the rest are effectively already decayed, okay? So how much of the density do I still have? Well, this is how much I have. That's the fraction of the regions where density wave, the density wave is still around. Okay, so at long times, what I'll have is a power law decay that goes like one over t to the power uh, one over z. Okay, and it basically, again, has, it's this Griffith effect that I'll be dominated at long times by those regions that are still, that still have not decayed. And their, um, and, and their fraction is changing as a function of time. Okay, is that, is that clear? So yeah, this is basically the you know solution to to this problem. One can do it you know a bit more um, uh, rigorously by by um, taking the average over uh, the, looking at the decay uh, as an exponential decay in the re different regions and averaging over these regions with their proper density. And doing the integral by the saddle point approximation, you can do it, and and you will get exactly this kind of decay. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, more questions? If not, then I'll um, start um, my you know plan for today. Uh, and but please uh, don't be shy and interrupt me for questions. Uh, now I'll talk about you know a seemingly paradoxical um, question. Uh, can we see sharp signatures? Really, maybe a sharp transit MBL transition in an open system, right? And well, so remember that the essence of many body localization. Kind of small review is we have a close. We need a closed system. If we we have a closed system, uh, and uh, deep in the mini body localized phase, we have uh, these local integrals of motion. Uh, uh, let's call them tau, like, like David did. Um, and and it, and on the other side, for weaker disorder, we have a thermal. Uh, Griffith phase where time scales and length scales are um, related by, by this dynamical exponent z that diverges at the critical point. So this is the picture in a closed system. Now what happens if we open the system? Well, if we open the system and now it can couple to this bath here, uh, right? This is coupling to a bath, then these local integrals of motion are no longer integrals of motion, they can decay they, now they couple not to some rare insulate uh, thermal region in the MBL phase, they couple to a bath right next to them. So if the coupling to the bath is epsilon, they're going to decay at a rate of the coupling to the bath is basically the decay rate to the bath. I, what I mean by epsilon, it's the matrix element squared over the uh, times the density of states of the bath. So, so uh, we will see that the expectation value, for example, of an uh, integral of motion is not zero. It's going to decay. Uh, sorry, it's not. Uh, it's not fixed. It's going to decay to zero uh, by by this coupling to the bath. So basically, there is no MBL once I open the system. Okay. So that is is that clear? Um, so wh why am I talking about this at all if there is no MBL? Well. Um, Consider the following 
scenario. Now, instead of coupling to a bat, I'm going to do another thing and I'm going to take a special limit, okay? I'm going to, on the one hand, couple my system to a bat at this coupling epsilon means decay rate, the time to thermalize with the bat is um, one over epsilon, okay? That's a time scale, one over epsilon. Uh, and, but at the same time, I'll couple it to another bat. Let's say this is a cold bat. You can think of one bat as a cold bat and another as a hot bat. Uh, driving with light is like uh, white light is like um, coupling to an infinite temperature bath. Uh, and you will couple it with a coupling that is just proportional to epsilon. So it's some theta times epsilon and theta is a constant. Okay, so, so, so now we're coupling to two baths. So the system is out of equilibrium. It's not coupled to any bath and the coupling between the two, uh, two are proportional. Still, well, the system is open. Um, and if I have finite epsilon, I don't have any reason to uh, uh, expect that the, uh, the fact that it's two baths doesn't, seem to make a difference because still I can excite the, um, I can both decay and excite the um, uh, conserved quantities and they don't, they're not necessary. One, if I start them in some value, arbitrary value, they're obviously going to decay to some other value. They're not going to stay at what they were, okay? Um, sure. But actually they don't have to decay to zero now. They're not in equilibrium, that's one thing. And second, I'm going to take a very, very special limit. I'm going to take the coupling to the bath to zero. Um, I'm, I'm going to take the coupling to the bath to zero, but I'm going to do it only after I take the time to infinity. So basically uh, the meaning of this is I, I wait as long as I need to get equilibrated with these two baths, okay? So I get into a non-thermal equilibrium with these two baths. Uh, and, takes me a long time of order epsilon, uh, one over epsilon. I wait for a much longer time. So I went, wait for this equilibrium and then I take this epsilon to zero. Okay, so, so, I, I'm, in, so I'm, I'm going to take this very, very special uh, limit. And I want to claim that in this special limit, there is a, a sharp transition between what I would call MBL, quote, in quotes, there is one phase that is related to the MBL phase in, in absence of, of the coupling to the back to a thermal uh, phase. And, I, I, and so, so I'm going to be able to uh, find a sharp transition in this, uh, in this case. And the interesting thing is uh, the, the transition is not going to be sharp once I take epsilon to be finite. But the interesting thing now is when I take epsilon to be finite, well, then I'm going to broaden the transition somehow, but I'm going to broaden it in a universal way. So epsilon can be thought of as some relevant perturbation at a critical point. And if you know about quantum critical points, they can occur only at finite temperature, uh, uh, sorry, zero temperature, but we can probe systems only at finite temperature, but that's okay if we can change the temperature by, by looking at the temperature dependence, we'll, we can see sharp signatures of, of the underlying quantum critical point. So oh, yeah. the goal here is to bring this issue of MBL transition to the same level as quantum critical points. We have some idealized points where, point where the transition occurs and we can change tune epsilon and, and understand from the epsilon dependence, we're going to know something about the critical behavior. Um, hey, who, yeah. um, th th there's a question from Kasra. Yes, go ahead. So yeah, so yeah, I have a question regarding your uh, you know, previous slide mostly. So um, I was thinking that maybe I was actually wrong on this, but I was thinking that the avalanche analysis that you discussed earlier um, has to do with you know the coupling of the MBL phase to a bath and it, tells us that you know the MBL phase is uh, is is uh, stable when you even if you couple couple it to a bath. Um, um, but it's I, coupling, coupling to a finite bath. Right? Oh, I see. Because you always have if you couple to a finite 
It's a, it's a finite thermal region. I wouldn't say bath, right? It has to decide whether it's going to be a bath eventually or not. So it's, um, you're growing, it, the question is whether the level of spacing is collapsing faster than um, the, the matrix element for coupling, in which case it becomes eventually a bath, uh, or the other way around, in which case it, it basically is not a bath anymore and just absorbed inside the MBL phase. On the other hand, if you have a preformed bath that already has a zero level spacing, then there is no contest anymore. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Then the bath always wins because it starts from zero level spacing. So now I'm coupling to a truly, you know, continuous bath. The stability is not stability to coupling to a bath. It's an internal stability to rare small regions. Okay, any, any, any other question? But, but this is a good question for clarifying uh, here. What, what is the difference here? Yeah, it was good because yeah, it, it helps sharpen this point. Okay, so, um, okay, so why do I say that there are going to be distinct states here? Okay, so let's not start from this complicated problem of MBL, let's start from a much, you know, a much better known and essentially classical system that I can think about classically, which is a greenhouse, right? So let me take the MBL down and just look at why, why it's not, it's not really, it only likes to show full slides. Okay. So, so look only at the top part. Um, so, uh, uh, let's look at how a greenhouse works. A greenhouse is basically in the same situation as I mentioned before. It's coupled to the earth, which is a cold bath, right? And if it was just coupled to the earth, then the greenhouse would be cold, but actually we want it to be hotter. So what do we do? We uh, open it a little bit by, by making it from glass to um, a hot bath, which is the sun, the, the uh, light coming in from the sun. So if I write the equation, the rate equation for the energy, energy flow in and out of the greenhouse, so the energy um, time dependent, sorry, dE dt is equal to the energy flow from the sun, that's the source, oops, yeah. Uh, energy from the sun, and and there is a, a sink of energy to the bath. And you see that if I didn't have this source, then it would just, the steady state would just be uh, a thermal state, or it would be a temperature of uh, the bath, right? But now I have two of these, and the steady state I can actually, um, calculate very easily by setting the uh, left-hand side to zero. And I find that the temperature is um, the bath temperature plus theta, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, this is the case with the greenhouse. And if you've been inside the greenhouse, it feels normal. It feels like thermodynamics works. And that's because inside the greenhouse, at least for epsilon sufficiently small, well, at least in the limit that epsilon is, is, goes to zero, which is the limit that, or idealized limit I'm talking about, in, in, in this limit, there is a, a Gibbs ensemble inside the, the, um, uh, the uh, inside the greenhouse, okay? Now, the MBL system is very sim similar to that, except instead of having um, one conserved quantity, which is, uh, the energy without, uh, so uh, the greenhouse, it, there is no many conserved quantities, only the energy would have been a conserved quantity without the perturbation, uh, which is right, the coupling to the baths that destroy the uh, conserved energy. So now instead of that, we have many conserved energy, uh, sorry, many conserved local energies, uh, and we have to write rate equations, uh, local rate equations that determine not the global temperature, but 
all the local temperatures. Okay, so here is the rate equation, um, the change of each one of these HI is a local energy, uh, some local energy, which would be in the true MBL phase, it would be a local conserved quantity, right? Um, and, and there is a coupling to uh, the light that is proportional to theta times epsilon, it's theta times epsilon times um, uh, some conductance into the system, con energy conductance into the system. Uh, and it, it also has a coupling to a local bath. And in principle, because of this light, uh, coupling to the light, we also have uh, proportional to epsilon conductances uh, generated between the nearby uh, regions, right? So there are, it, you can have energy flow now inside the system due to this coupling to the bath, because now, while it was not conducting before, uh, now that you were shining on it, we all agree it's not MBL anymore, and there is some, some uh, energy conductances. So this is just a discretization rate equation that tells you that I have an uh, uh, um, energy current proportional to the temperature difference between the two uh, nearby rings. Okay, so, so this is basically a discretized um, hydrodynamic equation for the, um, uh, for, for, for the energies. And, and now we can just solve for the steady state. It's going to be some linear equation and, and we're going to find, uh, so in, in the simplest situation, let, let me ignore it just to, to keep it simple. In principle, we can solve it even without, but we can uh, ignore these. And then it's immediately very easy to solve. And we find that there are these local temperatures um, and, and they're all uh, going to be fixed, not by the temperature of the bath at the, in this case, but by these ratios of coupling between uh, the coupling to the hot bath and the coupling to the cold bath. Okay, so, so we're going to get now many temperatures, but these temperatures are going to be in general uh, different from each other. So the difference between, uh, according to this, what is the difference between a thermal phase that has just a single local integral of motion, uh, sorry, a single global integral of motion, uh, which is the total energy, it's going to be to have a one, a single well-defined temperature. While what we find here is that when we have many local conserved quantities, many local conserved energies uh, at epsilon going to zero, we're going to find uh, many local temperatures that set these temperatures, okay? At many local temperature that set these energies and these temperatures are going to be set by, by the local couplings and the local couplings are disordered. So the temperature is going to have variation. So the, according to this, what we should expect is in, in this special limit, epsilon going to zero, the many body localized phase is going to be characterized by a finite variance of the temperature of the local temperature across the system, finite variance, a, fa a finite variance. Um, and in the thermal phase, we're, we're expecting to see zero variance of the temperature in this uh, epsilon to zero limit, okay? And maybe a quick digression, I don't have much time, you know what, I'll, I'll leave it for you to read and, and then actually also do the exercise. So this will be, if you want, a guided exercise. But you can also, I, this was a kind of a completely classical formulation in the form of rate equations. You can similarly f formulate it in, um, in a quantum description in terms of a Lindblad equation. Uh, where you have two part, the, your density operator is evolving according to a uh, Hamiltonian, plus the coupling to the baths is, is through um, uh, Louvillian non-unitary term, uh, but it, this non-unitary term is proportional to epsilon only. And, and what I want to show is that you can, in, by in perturbation theory in this epsilon, 
you can find the um, uh, steady state density matrix in the limit of epsilon going to zero. And you find that in the limit epsilon going to zero, uh, you, your, your um, density matrix is defined by the uh, GGE ensemble, uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble, with instead of a single temperature with these many, many Lagrange multipliers or, um, um, or, or genera generalized inverse temperatures. Uh, and, and they're determined by, fully determined by, by the perturbation. And even in um, zeroth order in epsilon. So already at zeroth order in epsilon, we have a solution with that is determined by the, fully determined by the perturbation. Okay, so that's the nice thing. So in the limit epsilon going to zero, we have some. Um, we can see that the system used to be integrable. Um, so so yeah, I. I, I um, recommend to try to do this exercise. Uh, so, okay, so so in to test this idea, we um, the first thing we did is we did exact diagonalization in the strict limit epsilon going to zero. I won't go over how exactly one goes about doing this kind of exact diagonalization, but just to show you what that we indeed find phase transition, what we look at is the variance of the temperature over the average temperature um, in, inside the sample for different system sizes. The different um, lines are different system sizes. And this is the x-axis here is the disorder strength. And what you see is, is that there is Okay, so here you, you don't know there is a transition, but you see two very different behaviors uh, for a sufficiently large um, disorder strength. You see that regardless of system size, the uh, temperature variance remains constant and independent of the system size. Uh, this is in the strict epsilon going to zero, epsilon to zero limit, but it's, now the broadening is not because of finite epsilon. We, we can do this strictly in the zero epsilon limit in exact diagonalization, uh, but there is a broadening of the transition due to the finite size. But what you see is that um, beyond some point, there is a very clear exponential decay of uh, the variance with the system size. So this is the smallest size. This is a larger size, larger size, larger size. It decays exponentially. And one can now try to scale this uh, in, uh, um, if, if, if we uh, scale all of them on top of each other by rescaling both the y-axis and the x-axis, you get a universal curve, um, and which, which means that there is, uh, or at least within this very small size numerics, it looks like there is a critical point. Um, and, and, you know, the idealized picture is this. We are now calculating with exact diagonalization in the strict epsilon to zero limit, and we expect to see some uh, sharp transition where this variance goes to zero. In reality, we'll always have some finite epsilon, even if we have an infinite system, and that is going to broaden the transition. And maybe because of, because any, any realistic system, even if it's very large size, not like this ED system that's very small, will always have finite epsilon. Maybe the most interesting thing to understand is how this transition, what happens to this sharp transition in the presence of finite epsilon, okay? So let, let's address this next. Um, so, to address mm -hmm. this, the simplest way is a mm -hmm. hydrodynamic description. I can take the rate equation I wrote before and, and write it in terms of a hydrodynamic equation for uh, the energy. So if I don't have the right-hand side, the right-hand side is zero, this is simply the diff diffusion equation for, temp for um, energy. Or if you mm -hmm. want, this is, yeah. Um, can you go back to the uh, discussion of your jump operators? Uh, so, so I guess, are these results, uh, should these, I think of these as sort of for generic jump operators, 
Yeah, you know, would it be different if the jump operator is only couple, if your bath only coupled to like conserved quantities or something? Um, I guess what 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 are the uh, jump operators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here? So so here I don't um, specify at all what my bath operator is coupled to. So it's it's pretty generic now. You, you ask, okay, if my I, I coupled only to conserved quantities, that would still be the same. So, okay, the important thing here is it, if I want to describe this in terms, okay, so there is something really important. Um, if I want to describe it in terms of a Lindblad equation, I can't couple only to um, Hermitian operators. Okay, because if, if my Lindblad term will only couple to Hermitian operators, I'm going to get a unital quantum channel, so to speak. And this unital channel means that I'll always find myself at an infinite temperature um, steady state. So, so my, my uh, and, and this is basically a statement that I need to have, I can have part of them Hermitian, and that would be like a coupling to my infinite temperature bath. They would be like noise. But I also have to have other Lindblad terms that will take me away from this infinite temperature like um, uh, um, steady state, infinite temperature steady state. So I need some other Lindblad operators. I'll show a concrete model in, in a few slides. So if I only couple to the conserved quantities, yes, I'll get nothing because it's not really two baths. It's like two baths uh, it's coupling to just an infinite temperature bath and then there would be nothing. What, what did you take for the numerics? What were the jump operators? So I didn't do numerics yet. So um, this is oh. not Lindblad. This, this is exact diagonalization. Uh, let, let me skip because it will be a, actually some okay. longer, longish explanation. Uh, okay. In the end, one can, in the limit epsilon to zero, one can recast all of this as rate equations between exact eigenstates of your system, where the rates are Fermi golden rule that transitions uh, that are um, uh, Fermi golden rule transitions between eigenstates due to the coupling to, to your bath. Uh, and uh, for example, it's, it could be a phonon bath. So we took a phonon bath and because we're in, the reason why we're interested in this, I think okay, be, besides, I think the fact that I think fundamental importance that in principle, you can have a sharp transition and you can study it in a controlled way by turning on epsilon. And the dream is to be able to see effects of many body localization in a solid state system. Uh, Right? And the problem is that solid state system is always coupled to phonons. However, by tuning temperature, you actually um, also tune the coupling to the phonons because at least if you were coupling to the acoustic phonons, uh, there is strongly suppressed coupling as a function of temperature, um, ma the matrix element for coupling. And uh, on the other hand, you can, you, you, always have other sort of noise and you can, which you can also control. You, you, for example, you can shine light on the system uh, and, and, and then you can ask whether by controlling the, you know, both coupling to the phonons and to, to the light, you can see, um, you, you can start seeing effects of many body localization through the epsilon dependence. So that, that's the uh, idea. Um, yeah, um, um, so we didn't have specific yeah. jump. Yeah, so, so okay, to your question, here it was coupling to phonons and we didn't have specific jump operators, but what I show next, yeah, there is going to be a specific concrete model with specific jump operators that we're using. So I'll, I'll show it. But before that, just for the analytic understanding, we, we don't, we, we, we also show actually that this Linda description can be at long wavelengths, it basically goes to this kind of hydrodynamic uh, equation. And the hydrodynamic equation is very clear, right? This is the continuity equation. This is the energy current. Um, yeah, this is the energy current, uh, sorry, JE here. Uh, and this is a source term due to uh, energy source term due to the hot bath. And this is an energy sink term, a dissipative term due to the coupling to the cold bath. Okay, and now if I say that 
the, and this is the conductance of the system into, or epsilon times theta times this is the conductance into uh, the, um, uh, from the hot bath to my system. And this is the conductance from the cold bath out of my system. And these are um, assumed to be disordered through the system because the system is disordered. Um, this is the equation. And now we're going to solve it by, um, okay, assuming first of all that this disorder is in some sense uh, small um, in, in this hydrodynamic description at least, um, we're, we're going to assume that this uh, disorder in the conductances is, is, is small enough. Uh, so I'm going to say that G12 is equal to one plus some noise, not, not noise, um, some random uh, element. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also going to define delta T as the deviation from the average temperature of my system. So now I'm, I'm, I can just rewrite this equation for steady state uh, in, in these variables and now expand in powers of these um, uh, disordered conductances. And note that this delta T, if, if I don't have this order in the conductances, delta T is fixed, it, it's, it's very simple. I can, uh, uh, I, I, I basically get some, uh, I, I don't have any delta T uh, from, it's all in the, av the average. And because of this disorder, I'm going to have a delta T of order size. So now I can look at zeroth order in psi. Zeroth order in psi is very simple. I, I can neglect this. I can neglect um, basically this and this, and I can solve immediately the algebraic equation. And I get what you expect that what I got before that the average temperature is simply the bath temperature plus the cold bath temperature plus this theta, the hot bath temperature if you want. Uh, or the coupling to the hot bath, not the temperature. Um, now, the next, next I'll go to linear order in these. In, in these. Uh, so in, to linear order, what I have left of, of this equation is just this. Uh, and I, I assume where it's, this zeta is, is the difference between these two. So you can, okay, as an exercise, you can show it. And an even nicer exercise is now to solve this linear equation. But you, so it, that's pretty simple. You can solve it with Green's functions. Uh, so because it's, it's a, just a linear equation, uh, delta t is, is given by, by this. And the Green's function is uh, quadratic. Uh, uh, and now I can solve for the variance of the temperature, which is what I want to show, right, in the MBL phase. The crucial thing in the MBL phase, OK, the, what makes the MBL special? OK, so now there are two phases. The MBL phase, what is special about the MBL phase? What is special about the MBL phase is that the conductance here is 0 in the MBL phase. However, it's not exactly 0, right? It's because I have a finite epsilon, it's going to be epsilon times some finite value chi, OK? It's going to be some epsilon times chi in the MBL phase. Because the only thing that gives me conductance is the coupling to the external bath. Um, so now you see epsilon, basically, if you have epsilon everywhere, epsilon can go away. And what you get is an epsilon independent result to this order, OK? And so what we're going to find is delta t, which is independent of epsilon. And now we can uh, take the variance, delta t squared, and average over the disorder. In, in this way, and we find um, now solve it in two lines, and you'll find that it's some constant. Uh, so delta t is going to be proportional to some to, to theta. Okay, and so it's independent, um, in, in independent of epsilon. Order one. That's what I mean when. 
I say or it's order one in the MBL phase. And again, the key is that the conductance here, uh, 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 the con thermal conductivity here is proportional to epsilon by it itself. So epsilon basically goes away from everything. Okay, everything, both the right hand and the left hand side of the equation in steady state is proportional to epsilon. In the other phase, in the thermal phase, it's different. Well, in the thermal phase, well, if I was, if, if I was in a usual diffusive thermal phase, the conductance would be uh, wave vector independent. I'll just have a constant conductance or uh, gamma. Uh, to generalize a bit, I'm assuming that the conductance can be wave vector dependent in this way, which makes it uh, non, um, uh, will not will make it non-diffusive. This is kind of a um, poor man's way of inserting um, uh, non, the sub-diffusive physics. Uh, basically to make the Green's function uh, have the correct, um, uh, the, the, the correct relation between space and time, um, to, to make it uh, sub-diffusive, okay? So that's basically the idea uh, um, here. And, and now you can, again, as an exercise, derive the result that now uh, the fluctuation in temperature are proportional to epsilon to the power one over two Z. And the way to derive it is simply, again, to write the equation inserting this kappa, which is, uh, temperature at which it which is um, insert this as, as the first thing you can do is just take a constant cup and then find that this goes like uh, then z equals two and you find that um, this goes like epsilon to the power one quarter so um, do this first then um, do uh, a, maybe a, you know leap of faith and uh, basically insert by hand the Green's function where z is not two. And uh, again, solve in the same way. Basically, delta t squared is going to be always equal to that. And the only difference between different equations is the Green's function is going to have a different form. Um, but now it's not going to be uh, gapped Green's function, if you want. It's going to, to be this. Uh, and the only thing that sets the gap is epsilon. So everything will depend on, on epsilon. So you'll have this uh, infrared dependence on epsilon that will give you a non-trivial power here. Okay, so, so try to show this. And, uh, but the upshot is we see that in the thermal phase, as we get closer to the MBL phase, we see from the epsilon dependence of the uh, local temperature variance, uh, we, we see this exponent uh, z. And in principle, we can read off how it's uh, diverging at the critical point. OK? Uh, I see some question here. Uh, a hand raised. It's Seren? Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. So um, in the previous slide, um, I saw there, like, the, you're assuming um, if you can go to the previous slide, actually. Um, I think you were assuming this um, no correlations between random disorder, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So are you assuming this to be able to do the integral, you know, more straightforwardly if I had some correlations um, in the disorder? Would I get a similar result in the MBL phase? Um, Okay, if, if the correlations were really non-trivial, like long range correlations in the disorder. Um, yeah, well, okay, in the MBL phase, I think almost nothing could um, ruin this. Uh, although I, I think it's probably not physical to put in these long range correlations uh, because they, they would have to come from some long range correlations in the microscopic disorder. And then maybe in presence of these uh, long range correlations in the microscopic disorder, you wouldn't even have MBL phase. But the only way the MBL phase comes in here is through this epsilon dependence of kappa. The fact that kappa at 
zero epsilon is zero means that the system is localized, right? It's localized because when we take epsilon to zero, there is no con uh, energy conducted. So the only way uh, the MBL phase is taken here, it's basically taken phenomenologically by hand by making kappa zero at the zero epsilon limit, okay? So now, and, and the fact that I'm going to get some result that is independent of epsilon and has a spatial variation is basically now guaranteed once I take, and it, I, I, I think the non-correlation between psi at different Rs is not really super important. It's just going to uh, change this from a delta function to something much maybe more complicated, but it's still going to give me some something that depends on, on R. It, what is true is that I'm going to generate correlations between the temperatures, okay? The temperature is still not going to be, I, uh, yeah, so, so maybe it, the interesting thing is I, I'll have to look at the temperature correlation function then uh, and not only the temperature variance and maybe I can see uh, signatures of these correlations in the disorder, um, but I'll still see um, order, order one variations in the temperature. Thank you, yeah. Um, okay, so thank you for the question. Yeah, so now uh, this whole concept of having signatures of MBL at some small but finite coupling to the back, uh, right? Because now we talk about not zero, strictly zero epsilon, we're interested in some varying epsilon. This suggests a, a new numerical approach to MBL uh, in an open, basically an approach in an open system, um, right? So we, we take a limit where first we take the infinite time limit, we want steady state, in the presence of some small epsilon coupling to the back. The idea is now to use TBD to compute the steady state, rho infinity, so to speak, um, and, and, in, and use TBD. TBD is a time evolving block decimation. It's um, basically using an ansatz for a density matrix in terms of a matrix product operator. Um, if you don't know what it is, ne never mind now. Um, it's, it's basically DMRG uh, to solve uh, this uh, time dependent DMRG for solving uh, this kind of Lindblad equation. And the nice thing is that we would expect that if epsilon is finite, epsilon will decohere you and limit the growth of the necessary bond dimension. So you might believe that you can handle much larger systems than exact diagonalization. And indeed, that's what we find. We can handle systems um, of order 100 sites quite easily, I would say, uh, without any issues with bond dimension being a bottleneck for anything. Okay, We have another problem, which is the bottleneck, but it's not the bond dimension. Um, so, uh, so, so that's a really, really nice thing. So uh, the, uh, another really nice thing about this approach is that now, because we have this epsilon, we don't have discrete, there is, you, you can't think of this system as a system with discrete levels. And a lot of the finite size issues of ED have to do with the fact that at the accessible sizes to ED, there are, um, the system still has discrete levels and there are all sorts of commensurability issues between levels and there is competition between single particle physics, single particle level spacings and many body level spacings. All of these are transient effects from the fact that by definition of an exponential uh, increase in hardness of calculation, we can only calculate before we get to the real many body regime. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and 
and, and all of that has to do with this discreteness of level spacing. And but in, in this approach, we effectively broaden the levels by epsilon and regulate these uh, finite size transients, if you want. Now, of course, there, there is still a problem. Uh, one problem is that we, we need to simulate the density matrix and not the state, so, so it's a larger physical dimension. There is still going to be a problem that epsilon uh, is going to be limit, basically, we want to take, take epsilon to zero to be able to see um, this, these kinds of power laws. Now, um, we want to see a diverging Z and to see a diverging z, uh, you know, it's very hard to see something like a power epsilon to the power point zero zero one. Uh, you will need to go to spectacularly low epsilon, uh, which means that you will need to go to, and and what does it mean going to um, a small epsilon for this calculation? In order to um, converge to equilibrium, you will have to at least go to time much larger than inverse epsilon. So it means that you will have to wait longer and longer times as uh, to, to for the system to equilibrate as you get closer to the critical point. So this is definitely uh, uh, you know a problem, uh, but I, I claim this is not really a problem of the simulation. Even if we had a perfect quantum computer, we'll have the same problem. Um, yeah, um, Siren, you have a question? So um, when you're doing the uh, TBD with uh, open system, are you modeling the bath or or the how does the bath get into the... Um... Yeah, so, okay, I didn't show my model yet. So okay. should, should I, maybe the next uh, slide mm -hmm. is showing the model. So maybe that can answer your question. Yeah, so how do, how do I express the bat? So, so first thing I claim is I don't really need to have a true model of a bat. And so to be physical, I talked about the hot bat, cold bat, and all that. But all I need really to find this physics is to be in a non-equilibrium state. Uh, the system needs to find a raw that is a non-equilibrium raw. It's not... Uh, the same as uh, equilibrium uh, density matrix. And for that, all I, I need is, is some combination of Lindblad operators that would do that. And you know, to, to go back to this physical uh, two bath problem, I can I can think about Lindblad operators that in so so here is my uh, Lindblad equation. Um, I, I have some Lindblad operators that implement the hot bath, and that's easy. I, I simply have dephasing, local dephasing, using SZ operators as jump operators. That would be the hot bath. And to have a cold bath, I need something that will be a non-unital channel, that if I had it alone, it would bring me to some density matrix that's not the um, infinite temperature density matrix. And, and to get that, I may, maybe by the way, it would have been enough to have the T cold and I, I wouldn't even need the hot at all. The reason I wanted to have the hot bath as well, I wanted to have some control parameter also to be always somewhat close to being in an infinite temperature density matrix, because we know that in an infinite temperature density matrix, I'm going to converge to something with very small bond dimension. So if I'm close to that, in some, in some sense, I'm still probably going to be in a small bond dimension uh, space. Um, and, and the cold bath, I have to have some non-trivial bath uh, uh, jump operators. For example, these, these are jump operators that, well, it, it, the details are not so important here. The details here are only to keep symmetry, so I won't have current. I, um, I want to have uh, jump operators that are overall inversion symmetric. Um, but I, for example, I have um, creation of S plus on site I times a projection to um, the downside on, on the next, in the next site. And I, I have a combination of Lindblad operators 
such that in steady state, I'll have some finite density and I'm not going to just decay all the particles. Uh, so I have both S plus and S minus and I symmetrize with respect to um, inversion and that gives me, um, you know, non-unital channel and that's enough. So that's what I do here. So this, this uh, the cold bath is some non-unital channel uh, and uh, that I want to have no current and, and and, and the hot bath is a unital channel, meaning a channel that will give you uh, the steady state, uh, an infinite den temperature density matrix is a steady state. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Uh, yes. What does P stand for in the jump operators? Uh, what does P? P is a projection okay. to the a downspin on, okay. site, on the site. Just a one plus sigma uh, z, uh, or is a spin up and one minus sigma z. Right. Uh, yeah. So, but it, I, I, you can in principle choose anything. I, all, all of what I said is very universal, and we we actually tried with different ones, and it works essentially the same way. Um, of course, you need to keep certain things. You don't want that your final state will have just all, all particles down. That's kind of a stupid final state that will not work. So, so as long as you don't have that, then everything works. Um, uh, and okay, so, so here are the numerical results. Now we can, we can run it and monitor the local temperatures. There is also a question, how do we monitor the norm at local temperatures? It's not, so we're not doing it, the you know, completely physical way to do it would be to uh, uh, attach a thermometer to the system. A thermometer is a bath with a fixed temperature and set the, um, and ask what is the temperature of that bath have to be uh, so that there is going to be zero energy flow between the system and your bath when you attach it at point I, okay? That is the real physical definition of local temperature. And in, in this ED result, essentially this is what we do. I, I didn't talk about the exact scheme, uh, but here it's much, much harder to do that. We also do, did something like that, but the simplest, we, we take an ad hoc approach and uh, we define the temperature by minimizing a cost function, which is we take local regions uh, of two sites and uh, 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 compute the local, uh, uh, the, the reduced density matrix in this local region and find what is the thermal density matrix of two sites that uh, is closest to what we see here. Uh, Okay, so, and, and, and that gives us a local temperature. Um, so so by, by minimizing this cost function over all the possible temperatures, um, and that gives us a local temperature. And now we can look at um, the, uh, what, see, see if um, uh, the predictions hold. So the main prediction we wanted to see is whether, um, there is the, temp the epsilon dependence, the dependence on of the temperature, spatial variance of the temperature on epsilon goes like one over two Z and we expect Z to diverge at, at the critical point uh, when we take epsilon to zero. So here are plots of, this is instead of delta T over T, it's delta inverse temperature over inverse temperature um, uh, average. Uh, so, so here uh, it's dif different lines now correspond to different uh, disorder strengths. And you see it strong disorder. Uh, we see basically this kind of goes to some constant here, while at weaker disorder, there is the, the variance uh, goes down. And if we zoom into these regions, we see that it goes down and actually does seem to converge to um, power laws. And, and we can fit this power law to one over two Z uh, and fit Z by through this power law. 
and see that as we approach the critical point, indeed Z diverges. And remember that we expect Z to be uh, something like psi over L naught. So from the divergence of Z, we can extract the critical uh, exponent nu, which is the critical exponent that controls the divergence of the correlation length near a critical point. And um, from, from this, we find uh, nu pretty large. It's, it's larger than four. And therefore, it, it actually is consistent with being a KT transition where nu diverges, actually. So, so it, it's interesting that in this approach, we don't suffer from the same issues that uh, exact diagonalization calculations of um, uh, MBL find uh, in, in ED people find, um, in usual ED, not open system, people find nu equals approximately one, which is um, inconsistent with the Harris criteria. Nu can only, can, nu actually has to be larger than two over D. Uh, to, to get a consistent critical point. Uh, and, and that's not seen in exact diagonalization calculations. So actually trying to make sense out of these exact diagonalization calculations and say that you know, there is no MBL because of them is, is really, really dangerous. Clearly they, they get something totally wrong that is inconsistent with, uh, um, in, inconsistent with basic theorems. So, so at least in this framework, we get uh, reasonable new. Uh, the, the Harris criterion applies to these. Yes, it's not just the equilibrium. You know, normal phase transition. Yeah. So first of all, yeah, that's a good, very good question. And um, if you look at the proof by Chase, Chase, and uh, Spencer, and who else was there? And it, it actually does not. Yes, equilibrium or non-equilibrium, and it should apply. But there is a specific paper about this, very nice paper by Anushya Chandran and uh, um, Vadim Ganesian was there. I forgot who else, but uh, um, which actually restates this theorem clearly in, in uh, the context of MBL and shows that actually everything checks out also there. So it, if there is a, a critical point, it should have um, new larger than one. And if you see something smaller, fine, you could see some um, uh, crossover effect of non-interacting physics, or, or actually it's, it, it, it's probably few body physics that you're seeing and not really the, the uh, MBL transition. You see some few body crossover. Um, and which is, I think, what um, my, my impression is that a lot of um, ED results, which are limited to about 20 sites, what they see is really few body physics. You're not nearly as close as we want to be to, to uh, the critical point, um, to the scaling, scaling limit. Um, and, and here it looks like this, uh, by the way, this was done on a hundred site system or 60, somewhere between 60 to hundred sites. Now, of course, the limit here is not the time, not the, um, not the length of the system. We could, we might as well do it even on 30 site system. The problem is the, the time scales, right? Because you see, we can't go to too small epsilon because we don't have the patience to wait. Um, so that, that's really the, the problem. Okay. I have a quick question. So yeah. are these results, these are all just disorder averaged over some set of initial states? Uh, yeah, good. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember uh, how the disorder average was done here. Yeah, but we, we find, that's right. I think that was disorder averaged after everything. So you basically do the calculation for different disorder realizations and average mm -hmm. over uh, these realizations, yes. And the second question is that for varying openness, you sort of lose, you eventually lose track of your canonical MPS form. So then how important is that? And also 
looking at the. Uh, sorry, uh, when do I lose track of uh, my canonical end? Yes, with yeah. well, as you evolve under block decimation and open dynamics, I my thought was that you would lose kind of your sense of your canonical form of your original MPS as you evolve it. Is that no, no, no? And um, you you always bring it back to canonical form. There, there is no issue that I. Um, I don't think that's the case. It's MPO, by the way, not M yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and and we truncate in a usual um, way, but the truncation is not an issue. The truncation errors are very small, and we found we looked at the convergence with bond dimension, and that's not really the issue here um, for for these calculations. It's a, it's a good question whether when we go to the critical point itself, there might be a bond issue of bond dimension. Then you need to capture quantum mechanics happening at very long scales. In, um, and, and there, I think the bond dimension will start to be an issue regardless. And it, you might not notice it by looking at the truncation error because you're close to some infinite temperature um, density matrix, so the error is small, but all the interesting effects come from this error. So, so if you want to look at if, if all the interesting effects of delta beta over beta come from, from these long um, uh, clusters. The, the reason why it's not such a big deal is that um, uh, the time scale diverges much, much faster than the length scale. So, so we can mm -hmm. capture in, in the time scales we can calculate, there is no problem of sizes that are beyond what we can capture. Uh, and the reason this does much better than ED, I think, is exactly because it's embedded in a bath and it, um, absolves us of all these commensurability and finite size transients associated with uh, few body physics. That, that is, uh, I think, the main issue. It's not really that we can go to effectively larger sizes because effectively, because the time is limited, we cannot really see um, thermal region, regions in the MBL phase or MBL regions in the thermal uh, region that are larger than um, uh, the size uh, dictated by the time scale we have. So, so um, I, I think the true size we can capture is limited by that. Um, Sorry, question? Okay. Yeah, question? Um, yeah, so uh, can, can you do, uh, you know, this, this kind of TVD analysis to, uh, to a, to an isolated MBL system, I, I, I guess probably not. Uh, what's the reason that you can do it in this open system and not in the isolated system? I, I might be wrong in the. Uh, 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 um, yeah, it, 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 the, the problem is if you're in an open system, you have a unitary evolution, right? And you, you then you don't need to do um, TBD of density. You can do, it, and people did. You can do it um, with, um, uh, and then, then you can do it with states, right? But, but you have growth of entanglement then, right? And, and uh, so, so, so you are, you, as you get closer to the uh, transition, you will always get growth of entanglement. If you're in the thermal side, you can't do anything. The entanglement will grow uh, um, with time in, in some power law in time and, and that will mean that you will have to uh your your you will still have some exponential growth or stretched exponential growth of the bond dimension that you will need right so the this difference is that if you have unitary dynamics you're going to always have a growth of the uh state entanglement entropy mm -hmm. uh, and yes. it's it's going to um, you know, kill your calculation after a pretty short time. So here, the difference is that you have you have coupled to a high temperature hot bath, and yeah, yeah, basically, you, basically, yeah, that's right. So, so, and so you you converge. Your goal is to converge to um, infinite time 
steady state density matrix that's not supposed to be highly entangled state. In a thermal Yeah. Well, in the thermal case, but even in the non-thermal case. Um, even in the non-thermal case, it's not very different. We don't expect, at least in the two sides of the transition. Let me say it that way. In the thermal phase, it's going to be thermal. So, and thermal density matrix is not very uh, entangled, right? Uh, and in the MBL phase, at least deep in the MBL phase, you're also not very entangled uh, at infinite, you're, you're expecting things to completely decouple almost. The only thing that becomes entangled is that you have some thermal regions or, or pre, yeah, these almost thermal regions uh, inside the MBL. So when these become large, close to the critical point, maybe that's your only issue. But on the two sides, you're, you're completely safe. While in um, TBD of a unitary model, you're going to have, in the thermal side, you're completely screwed. And it turns out that you're actually, um, even way before you get to the thermal side, you, you, it's, it's hard to calculate. So, um, so, so this, the fact that here you're safe on both sides makes it much easier. So I just wanted to point out we have five minutes left. Uh, so oh, wow. we should kind okay. of uh, wrap I up. I was hoping to already get to the next topic, but I guess, uh, yeah, this will wait for next time. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if there's anything you want to conclude uh, here to wrap up before. Um, yeah, I don't know. So actually, that was my last slide. I was going to go to my next topic. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let people answer questions. Or if you want, I can preview what I want to talk about next, uh, and whatever. Yeah, so further questions? Um, should I go to my you know, preview? I, I think you can give us a preview. We've had a, a lot of discussion here. So okay. <laughs> I, I think that any questions people okay. had have probably been asked. Okay, okay. So let me let me give a preview. So my, it was supposed to be outlined for lecture, uh, lecture two and three. Uh, and I'll have to give a single lecture, I'll, I'll have to see how I, I condense it a bit, but um, maybe I'll go over the intro faster. Uh, but I, I want to uh, talk about introduction to quantum scrambling and why it is interesting. Uh, I'll talk about what is the out of time order correlation and as a measure of um, growth of operator size, how it's connected to quantum chaos uh, or chaos in classical systems also. Um, why it's, uh, why scrambling is an extremely important uh, concept in modern quantum information. Um, and, and then maybe give a short survey of, you know, models and approaches for pe uh, people use to calculate uh, um, scrambling of quantum information in interesting regimes. Um, probably I won't get to three, but then I, I'll focus, what I want to focus most on is because this is so important to quantum information and a lot of the modern uses for scrambling are for quantum information applications, I want to discuss scrambling in random circuits, random quantum circuits, um, how, to describe operator growth in, in quantum circuits. I'll show you that there is a very nice mapping from um, the growth that dynamics of a random unitary circuit to effective spin models that describes scrambling. And then um, I'm going to uh, leverage this uh, model to do something nice. First of all, I'll tell you about uh, a very, uh, now quite famous and beautiful thought experiment by Haydn and Preskill um, that shows that actually scrambling 
gives right allows you to automatically do teleportation of quantum states if you scramble enough. Uh, then I'll use the fact that I, I you know I taught you this mapping to statistical mechanics, and I want to show you how this thought experiment, how this uh, teleportation scheme works um, from the point of view of this statistical mechanics model. And what this will allow to do is without being Kitaev, you can by yourself see that there is an efficient decoding scheme uh, to this uh, uh, um, teleportation. Uh, it also immediately allows you to generalize and answer questions uh, such as uh, how robust is this kind of teleportation to errors and, and other things. And you can very easily, in even in a very fast qualitative way or in a you know, deeper analysis quantitatively, address uh, quite complex issues with uh, a mapping, using a mapping to statistical mechanics model. I intended to also go uh, then um, generalize this statistical mechanics model to non-unitary circuits where there is also um, measurements involved uh, and, and talk about entanglement transitions in, in random unitary circuits with measurements. But my feeling is that I'm not going to be able to get to that next time. Um, but yeah, if you want to hear about this, um, I gave other talks about this. You can you can see online or ask me uh, directly. There's a lot of comments on the chat that you know uh, you should give four lectures. Uh, uh, tell us all about it. Uh, probably uh, you're not up for that, but uh, but I do think that a good approach could be if you know if you give us the background in this lecture, you can point us to more specialized seminars and things. And, and okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, that sounds really exciting. I, I do hope to f cover at least one and two here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really want to get to the Haydn Preskill experiment and show you how it's really nice to understand it from a point of view of, of uh, statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think uh, this is a good place uh, to kind of wrap up. Uh, if anyone has questions about the outline, I guess you can ask, but maybe that's better for next time. Okay. Good. It was nice to see you all. Great. So I will see everyone in half an hour. Uh, thanks, Ehud, for the great lecture. See you all.